Good morning. Good to see you. Wonder with me, if you will, consider with me, if you will, what is God's greatest purpose, his greatest goal? What is it that he is, he is achieving right now in the story that is unfolding in, 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 in our world, in our lives, individually, collectively, in the church, on a global level. What is God's greatest purpose? What is he achieving in us, um, through us, in some cases in spite of us? What is his highest end? What is, what is, his, what is his goal? What is it that he is achieving at this very moment. Think on that for just a moment. Think on that for just a moment. There are a number of scripture passages that I could go to to answer that question, and and they would all square with one another. And you may you may choose slightly different words than I use. Don't trip on my exact words. Um, but do trip on this scripture passage if it is vastly different than what you might think God's purpose, his highest end is. Habakkuk, a book maybe you've never read. You should go back and read it sometime. Uh, it says this, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That, my friends, is, is God's purpose here on this earth. Globally, God is moving. His, his fame, his reputation, his glory, um, his, his purpose is that it might, it, might, it might flow around and through and all over the globe and grow and increase that his fame might one day cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And that, my friends, is God's purpose in your life. That is what he is doing, working out through your individual life, through our lives, collectively. The New Living Translation says, For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. That's what God is all about. Seeing his name and his fame and his reputation and his glory cover the entirety of the earth as the water covers the sea. This is the will of the Lord. And we see that in the teachings of Jesus. We see that in the marching orders that Jesus gave his disciples. And, and they are, no doubt, our marching orders to this day as the church. What Jesus said to the disciples, here's what you do. I'm going away. I'm going back to heaven. Here's what you're going to do. Jesus' last words, uh, they're, his, they're lasting words. He gave the marching orders to the disciples and he gives them to us to this day. He said, go now and make disciples of all the nations, not just your nation, of all the nations, of not just your people, but all the peoples globally. Go now and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And, and be sure of this, Jesus said, I go before you. I am with you always. And he makes it clear that he's not just take, talking to his disciples because he says, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So, so he says, I'm not just here with you 12 ragtag apostles who are going to get all of this started. 
And I'm not just with the early church. Jesus says, I'm not just with the, the church of the Middle Ages or the Protestant Reformation or the church of the 21st century. He says, no, I'm going ahead of you. I'm going before you. We will see this mission to its end. It will be accomplished. I am with you always. You can be sure of that to the end of the age. In other words, until he one day says, mission accomplished, and he returns to this earth. And that, my friends, is the chief end to which God is committed. His glory spreading throughout the earth as the waters cover the sea. And this is what we call mission. That's a nebulous word. It's a nebulous word that, that has... has Numerous, uh, numerous definitions in the church. And in fact, today, I may use two slightly different and yet congruent, complementary definitions of the word mission. Again, don't trip on that. Th th those are just my words. If we're going to trip, let's trip today on the words of Jesus, on the words of Scripture, not on my words. But, but mission it's a somewhat nebulous, can be a somewhat squishy word. What do we mean? And I would point you to these two passages. Seeing the name and the fame and the glory of God spread globally as he reclaims a, a people for himself. A people who were formerly uh, disavowed. A people who were formerly uh, in rebellion to God. Now they come under the submission of Christ. Now they become once again a family, a, a people of peace in harmony with the Lord. This is what we call mission. Mission activity. Now I'm going to use a few different words here. Listen closely. Mission activity is the forming and the building of churches where there were formerly no churches. You see, mission is not simply the saving of the individual soul, although that is, it, that is a priority, and that, that God is committed to saving you individually. He does know you personally like no one else. Maybe no one else knows your name. Maybe no one else knows your medical condition, but God does. He is committed to you individually. He is a, he is a personal God, and yet the mission of Christ, the mission of God... The chief end of God is not simply to save individuals because God's, God's goal, his purpose, his work, as we've talked about in the last few weeks, is, is building for himself a people, a family. And, and so mission activity is not just the saving of individual souls. It is the building of churches where there were formerly no churches. The, the forming of even more spiritual communities. Because communities matter to God. And, and the building, the building of communities. And the forming of new communities. Seven years ago we formed this new community. The, the forming of new communities spiritual communities matters to God. Why? Again, so that the earth might one day be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters fill the sea. Now what do we call this? The, the forming of new spiritual communities. The forming of new churches in places where there formerly were no churches. And that might be in, 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 in a vast pocket corner of the world that you, you have never been to, but, but God is, is going to take you there in the next 10 years. You just don't know it yet. When I say where there formerly were no churches, that, that, that is what I mean. But I also mean small pockets that are, that are a day's drive away 
or, or an hour's drive away. Maybe, maybe, maybe in Laguna Vista where, where there isn't a church uh, feeding some hungry soul that needs to be filled. Or maybe Southmost, or maybe Cameron Park, or maybe Almito. There are pockets of communities close by that need a light, that need a, a hospital, that need a church, that need a new spiritual community. So if church planting, that's the verb, some of you have heard that term used, some of you haven't, but that's what that's, that's the church word that we use, planting churches, starting new communities. If, if, if church planting is important, if it's important to God, then, then, then it should be all over Scripture. I mean, if it's not there, then, then, then we, we would we'd be hard-pressed to assume that, that at the heart of God is this matter of church planting. It would have to be in Scripture. And fortunately, it is. A whole book, a whole book in the New Testament is, is devoted to church planting, and that is the book of, of Acts, right? In which there were no churches. Jesus gives the apostles their marching order, and then they begin planting churches. And the chief church planter, the chief missionary, is the Apostle Paul. He wrote a number of the books in the New Testament, all these letters to the, what? To the churches. And they were all churches that he planted or that his young protege Timothy planted, and he would write them letters. Much like if I were to go away one day and I were to write you a letter and say, River Church, the church that I helped plant, I, I love you dearly, here's some instructions. So, so if, if church planting is at the heart of, of God, if, 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 it is, if it is in line with the purposes, the plan of God, that it should be all over Scripture and it should be, it should be all over the writings of the Apostle Paul, the great church planter of the New Testament. And we see that. We see that like when he instructs his young protege, Timothy, And he says this. He says, Timothy, you have heard me teach these things that have been co confirmed by many reliable witnesses, Timothy. Now, 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 here's what I want you to do. Teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to other trustworthy people and so on and so on. And the, 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 uh, the ESV uh, version reads that that um, let me have pages here. Paul instructs Timothy, "What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who be able to teach others also." And, and what is what is Paul uh, instructing Timothy to do? To to train up more elders. Why? So you can grow a bigger church? No, that you might send those elders out. That you might plant more spiritual communities. So, so that God's fame might increase. Might, might creep through your city. Might, might move throughout your county. And might move throughout your state. And will we'll cover the globe. And, and Paul, in another one of his writings, the Apostle Paul describes his church planting work with words that I can really relate to as a church planter myself. He, he describes his work as, a, as, as this, this, this construction work, this master construction work uh, in which he, Paul, is merely laying the foundation. Realizing that, that someone will come along soon and will build on that foundation. Realizing that, that, that not only will Paul one day die, and he did, but, but he realizes, Timothy, you will one day die. And he did. But some other, some other pastor will come along and will build on that foundation. And it will not be shaken. It will not, it will not crack. It will not. I, re, I recently heard, uh, read an international student uh, 
I think she was from Africa, and she said this. She said this of her church in Africa. She said, here's the difference between a church and, and a relief organization. She says, when I go back to my home, when I go back to Africa, she said, I don't know if my relief organization that I love and that has been so helpful to me, I don't know if it will be there anymore. It may run out of money. They may have to pack up and go away. She said, but, but the difference with the church is when I go home, I know my church will be there. It will still be there. There's something unshakable about a church. It's like no other entity. And Paul says, I lay the foundation. And it may, be, it may seem shaky at first, but I lay this solid foundation. And others will come along. Maybe I should share the, share the scripture with you. And build upon it, he says, according to the grace of of God given to me like a skilled master builder. I laid a foundation. And someone else is building upon it. In, in this case, at this moment in time, Paul had already, he'd already left. He'd already left, but he'd laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. This is mission. This is mission activity. And you know when the church loses this priority, the priority of mission, they settle for something else. When the church loses the priority of mission, they settle for trying to get people to come over to their church from other churches. And you know... In some cases, that is a great idea. I want to be clear about that because there are some churches that, that no longer preach Jesus, that no longer preach the gospel, where maybe the light is starting to dim. And, and I, 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 I think that in some cases, the idea of people coming from other churches can be a good idea. But it is not the main point. It is not our main calling. That is not really primarily our mission. So, so how does, if, if, we've, if we've lost that vision, if we've lost that priority, the priority of, of mission, and we've made the church a bit more consumer oriented and we've, we've, we've chosen metrics of success based on uh, metrics, metrics, metrics of success that perhaps HEB or, or Walmart uses. If we've kind of drifted from the, the main priority and we've, we've started judging the success of a church uh, using the world's metrics, the world's um, measuring stick, how do we bring ourselves back to, to the basics, to to, to the priority of mission. And I believe it's this. When the church, and that's us, when the church prioritizes gospel mission over all other endeavors, we say, this is what we're here for. We're not primarily here for a great, uh, for, any, for, for any sort of great program. We're, we're here for, for, for mission. When, when the church prioritizes gospel mission and when the church prioritizes gospel community, then I, got, I think we got something to work with. Then I think we're back to the basics, what, what Christ has called us to. But, but, but forget one or the other and, and we're a mess. Forget gospel community and we're just a bunch of lone rangers trying to save people in our own efforts, raise them up to spiritual maturity in some sort of vacuum of community? Let me say this another way. Church planting is the end result of a commitment to mission and a commitment to community. And I believe if we aren't committed to both, the mission of Christ suffers. Ch church planting is a church activity. And, and mission activity is the, 
the forming, the building of churches where there formerly were no churches. The forming, the building of a church where there formerly was no church. Story time. Otis. Otis is a real guy. Doesn't live in Brownsville. I've changed his name. I'm not sure I've ever had a real friend named Otis. I wish, I wish to have a friend named Otis one time, one, one day. Um, Otis, a real dude, he became a Christian in his late 20s. Uh, he became a Christian during the latter part of his radio uh, disc jockey. I don't know if they still call him that, but his radio career. He became, a, he, be, he became a Christian. Late 20s, the latter part of his radio career. And he had never really been part of a church uh, in, his, in his life other than, you know, we call them Christmas and Easter Christians, right? He would go with his grandma or whatever, but he would go maybe a couple of times a year. But other than that, he was largely ignorant regarding the activity, the mission, the day-to-day -day life of the church. He was so excited, therefore, to attend his first church membership meeting. Business meeting would be a better term for it. Otis was excited to attend his first church business meeting. If you grew up Baptist like me, you, you shake your head like, why would anybody be excited about a church business meeting, right? So he attended, he attended, um, he, he, had, he had now for some time uh, attended uh, on, church, on Sunday mornings, you know, worship. Uh, and he had, he, had, he had recently been uh, baptized in the church by his, by his pastor. And now, now it's time for his first church business meeting. And so Otis, he was imagining what would transpire at his first church business meeting. And Otis had big, big, big dreams. He, he assumed this was the meeting where they would, they would come together <clears throat> and they would plot out the downfall of Satan, right? And, and, and they, would, they would come together and with charts and with graphs, they would, they, would, they would make the plans to see the gospel of Jesus move throughout the city and, and, and revival would take hold. And boy... Boy, was he disappointed when he went to his first church business meeting. The meeting was brief, and the topics were, were boring, and Otis left a bit, a bit disillusioned. And so I would, just, I would just ask us to contemplate, to consider the mission of Christ and, and where we are as a church So I want to take um, the rest of our time today, and, and I want to, to talk to you about this. What, what does a commitment to church planting look like? And I want you to, I want you to listen with both ears. Uh, I want you to listen with your heart, not just your brain. I want you to listen firsthand as though this relates to you, because it does. If you're a Christ follower... This does. This pertains to you. What does a commitment to church planting look like? What might, it, what might it take for us, River Church, in the next 12 months to plant another church? Now listen, many of you, you're naysayers. You're, you're a doubter. It's almost Christmas. It's time to watch that, uh, that movie again. You're, you're a doubter. When it comes to the idea that, that could, could River Church actually plant a church in the next 12 months? And I want to say, number one, yes, we can. And number two, that's where I'm headed. That's what I want to see us do. How could that possibly be? A dear, dear friend, a dear, dear friend um, this week said to me, man, Randy, um, knowing that, knowing that, uh, that that that, uh, that that finances have been a little tough here at River Church lately, and he said, "Man, you 
You'd have to be like an eternal optimist to, to not be a little discouraged. And you know, I went away from that realizing like, like when it comes to the church, man, I am. I'm like, I'm like a super crazy optimist. Like I really, really expect big things of us and big things of Jesus through us just in the next 12 months. So I preach this, I talk about this, like really believing what I'm saying is true. I really believe that, that great things are to, are, are to become for us, are, are in our future as a church. What might it look like for us to plant a church? What is it, what, what's it going to take? The one that's going to take for us individually, collectively, it's going to take a commitment to real people in a real church. Here's what I mean by that. Here's what I mean by that. We have traded, we have traded in Christendom, in, in the church universal, many of us, uh, we have traded a commitment to real people in, in a real church. We've traded that sort of commitment, we've traded it out for a commitment to the virtual church. Or we've traded that out for some sort of AI form of church. Where we're committed to like the idea of church. Or we're committed to uh, the, 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 the church on TV. Or we're committed to web church. Or we're committed to, to a, a personality who preaches on the web and preaches on TV. And I'm reminded of the, the, the passage in scriptures that says, don't forsake the actual gathering together of the saints. And some of us, even some of us here at River Church, we take a very fluid approach to the local church, preferring the church universal, or preferring a parachurch organizations and groups, or preferring national conferences. And if we're going to be about the mission of Christ, then we're going to be committed to church as a local expression, as a local community, real people in a real church. And, and the second commitment, if we are going to be committed to church planting as a church, then we're going to, it's very similar wording, we're going we're gonna to have, have a commitment to sharing our lives with real people in a real church. This is where it gets where it gets real, a lot of reels here, where it gets real, my friends. Uh, this is where it no longer is theoretical. In other words, you could say, yeah, like the church, I'm committed to real people in a real church. I like small church. I like real church. I like local church. I don't like church on TV, and there's nothing wrong with watching Christian TV, okay? I'm not, I'm not casting any, or throwing any stones here. But, but you'd say, like, I really am. I'm committed to the idea of the local church. Then I would say, you need to put your... Uh, feet in gear and you need to be committed to actually having relationships in the church. You need to make this, this commitment that, you've, that you have to the, the traditional church, the local church. You need to take it from being a theoretical commitment to making it a personal commitment. Chase a rabbit for just a moment. I, I know I know a couple of churches that are, that are smaller than us that have planted half a dozen churches. What's it going to take? <clears throat> what kind of commitment is it going to take for us to be a church planting church? There's a third commitment, and that is a commitment to, to the church doing mission rather than just sending missionaries. Now we can kind of check that box off, the latter, the latter half of this, that we, we, have, we, we help financially several missionaries globally. And I love those, those men and women that are, that are spread out around the globe planting churches. I love them. We love them. We know them all personally. They come see us once 
every couple of years when they come off the field. And, 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 and that, is, that is awesome. But if we are going to be a church planting church, then we, are going to have to have, we must have a commitment to actually doing mission. Not just sending missionaries. When we think mission, we must think the church. Not primarily missionaries that will leave here and go out, but we must think the church. Ron gave me this an hour, uh, 30 minutes ago. I haven't even read it yet, but it's, it's in today's, yesterday's, yesterday's newspaper in the religious religion section, and it says, um, share of Americans with no religious affiliation is growing. And it goes through a reputable, uh, it's the Pew Research Center, and it gives some numbers and some data, and I haven't even read it yet. But I thought it very providential that Ron, five minutes before I climbed up here to preach, handed this to me. There's work to be done here in our own backyard and around the globe. And are you engaged in mission? Are you, are you committed to mission? Are you committed to the community? Because if you're not committed to the local community, then I'm sorry, but I think you, you're not going to be very effective in your commitment to the mission of Christ. If you're not committed to the body of Christ, I don't believe you're going to be very effective in seeing the mission of Christ happen in your life. A, a commitment to the church. I, I want to read, I don't, I don't read quotes very often, but I'm going to read a quote to you here. This is uh, Steve Timmons and, Steve, and, um, and Tim Chester in, in uh, Total Church. That's the book, Total Church. We're talking about the commitment to church doing mission. And here's what they say. And their, their context is the EU and, and, and especially Great Britain. They're, they're planting churches in, in a, what we would maybe call a post-Christian environment, which we actually live in as well. And, and this is what they say. They say the future of the gospel, here mission, the future of the gospel in our society does not lie in adopting particular evangelistic techniques. Well, we'll have training here. We'll learn techniques on how to share, share your faith. We'll do all of that. But what they're saying, that the, the future of mission globally and locally does not lie in adopting particular evangelistic techniques. And, and the, the future of mission in our society does not lie in creating Christian political parties. And, and, and the, the future of mission in our society, in our society uh, does not lie in pursuing propaganda campaigns, but rather the future of mission in our society, it will only be by movements that begin with a local congregation. As imperfect as we are. So I would ask, what does that look like in your neighborhood? What does that like, look like in your community, in your, in, your, um, in your part of town? Or maybe in the town you grew up in. I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not prophesying here, but maybe, maybe a few of you, maybe God is calling you to do what I did, to move, move home to the town you grew up in and plant a church. I don't know. But I do know that the mission of God is intended to happen, to unfold in your life personally. There's a fourth commitment. Only two more. There's a fourth commitment. And that is a commitment to the church as a household of God. What do I mean by that? I mean that, that, that throughout Scripture, look at all these. We, the people of God, we're described as a household. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. If I delay, this is 1 Timothy, you may know 
uh, how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church. Uh, Hebrews, but, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And First Peter, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And I could go on. There are others. Uh, we, the people of God, we, the church, Throughout scriptures, we're referred to as the household of God. Why might that be? And the reason is, un, 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 undeniably, the reason is because Paul saw his Paul saw his missionary efforts primarily happening from one household to the next household to the next household, in which in which a a father would be saved or a mother would be saved and then the whole house would be saved and then and that person, he might be a community, uh, a community leader, uh, a person of influence. So, sin, so then the next household and then the whole neighborhood would come to faith uh, to the degree that, that Paul and the writers of the New Testament began calling the church a household of God because that was how God, and I believe that still is how God intends to see his glory engulf the globe. And therefore seeing your home, 100 North San Roman, or 25, 25 Palo Verde where I grew up, or, or wherever you live in this city, in this county, this is seeing your home as a place of mission activity and seeing, and, and seeing more families more households come to faith so that more churches might be planted, so that God's glory might continue to permeate our city and our county and our state and our nation and our globe. And this means that you, you will commit to the scary endeavor, the messy endeavor, endeavor of opening up your home to other people for the sake of the mission of Christ. Not simply for the sake of getting to know your neighbors, but for the sake of seeing the mission of Christ have a foothold in your neighborhood. One last commitment. This is my favorite one. It's the one that I probably need to hear the most, and maybe you do too. If we as a church are going to plant another church in the next 12 months, if we as a church are going to... Um, be committed to church planting in general and specifically it's going to take this last commitment that is a commitment to the power of imagination here's what I mean by that as long as we um, as long as we are compelled as long as we you and me we, as long as we are slaves to um, the consumer goods sort of view of what a church really is, then, then we're, we're never going to plant a church. As long as we see the church and the significance of the church uh, using the same metrics, as I've said, that McDonald's or HEB or Walmart or Amazon, like they're, the way they, they judge success and the way, you know, and, and when they decide to open up their next chain, as long as we use that same metric, we're never going to plant a church. Oh, but if we, if we imagine, if we dream big, then, then we can reinvent ourselves as a church. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can reinvigorate ourselves as many times as we want. Perhaps better said, as many times as we feel compelled to do so. As long as we are not slaves to this world's system and, and this, this world's uh, judgment and this world's way of, of determining success, if we just leave that behind, I have to tell you, if, if Paul, the Apostle Paul, would have been, would have been stymied and, 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 and enslaved, enslaved by what we consider success today, he probably wouldn't have planted any churches. That, that church in Corinth that I, that I read about where he says, I laid the foundation and, 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 and someone else came along and built on that foundation and then a, another pastor will come and build on that, on that foundation even still. That same church in Corinth, 
I, I chuckled this week when I read where Paul says to that church, that same church, he says, you know, I wish that I could like really feed you uh, like meat, he says, which is a metaphor for like spiritually deep things. He says, but you guys are still a bunch of babies. You still, you still, uh, you're still just living on milk. And I had to chuckle and I thought, you know, if, if I were Paul, I never would have planted my second church. I'd be like, even this church, you bunch of babies, you're not growing up. Why would I plant another church and do that when you won't even grow up? But he doesn't. He doesn't because the mission of Christ can't be thwarted. If Paul wouldn't have done it, somebody else would have. Okay, and if we're, if, we're, if we're stymied and locked in and slaved to this world system, then we're never going to do much. But I believe that we can reinvent ourselves. I believe that we can reinvigorate ourselves. I believe that there's a lot of work to do. A lot in the, the story uh, of River Church, there's still a lot of chapters to be written. So it's to that end that I, um, to use my, my friend's words, it's to that end that I am a, an, eternal, an eternal optimist. Not because I think I'm much, but because I believe that Jesus' work will continue. Let's pray.